Uh, first and foremost, Happy New Year to everybody, and welcome back to uh, a, a new edition of uh, Pi Data Ann Arbor. Uh, as usual, we'd like to acknowledge uh, NumFocus for uh, sponsoring our events, TD Ameritrade for offering us up this space to use for, for uh, Pi Data, and also for Midas, uh, the University of Michigan, for providing uh, the food here. Uh, important points, especially for people who are new here, are the emergency exits. There's an emergency exit right out front here, and also the doors that you just came in. Right to the right of it is uh, stairs to get down. Please do not use the elevator in case of fire. Uh, again, we're always soliciting for speakers uh, throughout the year, uh, so please reach out to us if you're interested in giving a talk. And I think that in April, we're going to try to aim to do another series of lightning talks, so uh, look out for that sign up as well. So those are the, I think I could, we're either going to maybe shorten it up a little bit and, and make sure that I, I do a good job limiting the, the number of people that we have, although we, we appreciate the enthusiasm. Uh, as always, Ben and I uh, are looking for feedback, so anything that we're doing right, but more importantly, what are we doing wrong, right, or things that we can improve on, we'd love to hear any of that feedback. And also, everything that we, that we talk about is posted on our uh, GitHub page, so go and check that out. And, uh, uh, you know, for respect to uh, Scott, make sure that if, uh, uh, during the talk, uh, unless the question is quick, please hold it until the end of the talk. And also remember that you're in a borrowed space, so please clean up after yourself. Uh, I'd like to read the PyData Code of Conduct. So PyData is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. Uh, we do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Uh, be kind to others. Do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for PyData. data. Attendees of violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. Thank you for helping make this a uh, welcoming, uh, friendly uh, event for everybody. And more importantly, I also want to point out that you know, we're very uh, happy to have uh, two high schoolers here joining us from from a nearby school without uh, and we're, we're we're very happy for everybody to be joining us in fact um, a quick icebreaker so considering all this frigid uh, uh, weather here today's icebreaker is uh, turn to somebody either on the left or the right and tell them what your favorite season is of the four seasons and why and introduce yourself so go ahead my name is Scott. I am Sean. My favorite season is winter. I like this season. Although apparently I can't right now. I, I think my favorite season is, is also winter. Because, because in, in most of the other seasons, there are mosquitoes. That's very good. Yes. So that's that another one. I like winter. Why? Why do you like winter? I like winter activities. Yeah. Which, which, which one are you uh, This year I did a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of cross-country skiing tours, and maybe I can get into hockey. How far do you get from the ski? Like, 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 as, a, as in, like, miles? Is that what you're doing? Or your, your, your length? Maybe two. I, I find that I'm not strong. If I get like, cross-country ski, cross-country ski, cross-country ski, cross-country ski, cross-country ski, cross-country ski, I, don't, I feel like I can't last like four blocks in the prior. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so related. So back in eighth grade, I was, I was an Alpine ski racer, right? Um, I knew a Nordic ski racer. And I knew Jesse Davis. And we used to have an argument about, you know, I would say Nordic is dull. You're going up and you're working against going on. And she said, no, you're lazy. You're going down. And I get to the work for you. She's gone on. You went two gold medals and several World Cup championships. Yeah. So you're lazy. I, I think she won. <laughs> she proved her point. Right? Yeah. Okay, and yeah, we're back. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. So hopefully uh, everybody, especially people who are new here, will have met somebody new uh, with similar interests. Uh, and uh, as always, we'd like to talk about uh, the this month in data science. So the, uh, my pick this month is Parquet. <laughs> so if you haven't heard of Parquet, it's a uh, data storage format, I guess uh, file format. Uh, so if you have columnar data, you can use Parquet. So instead of using CSVs, you can use Parquet. And it's really good for reading and writing really quickly. 
Uh, there's also metadata, and it's uh, recently introduced into uh, data frames in pandas. So you can do a df2 parquet or read parquet, and you can read these files. Um, and this was, I think, implemented by Wes McKinney. So check that out. And also, uh, where is Logan? So Logan Alstrom over here. Uh, Logan's team is hiring a data scientist, an intermediate level data scientist, yeah, right? Level. So if you're interested, please uh, chat with Logan uh, after the talk. And then finally, next month, very excited, thanks to Dr. Patricia over here. I forget your last Schuster. name. Schuster. Yes. Uh, Dr. Schuster. Uh, Katie Huff is coming into town. So Katie was actually uh, the keynote speaker at PyCon this past summer. And she's going to be talking about doing our best practices, doing our best practices as an open reproducible scientific computing. And that's on Thursday, February 15th, a day after Valentine's Day. So hopefully everybody can, can make it up for that. Uh, with that, uh, I'll let Ben introduce Scott, and I'll, uh, I'll flip this over to Scott and have you uh, turn on your mic. Yep. Um, yeah, so Scott Siebert and I met last summer at, uh, at SciPy. Um, he's fairly active in the scientific computing Python community. Um, he's coming from UW-Madison, talking about adaptive algorithms. Hopefully we get to see a number of funny cartoons that make us feel smarter. <laughs> <laughs> with that, thank you very much. Okay, I'm Scott, as Ben gave the nice introduction. Um, I would like to thank Ben and Sean both for having me here. This is really nice, and I've had a pleasant experience. Um, so I want to talk about crowdsourcing machine learning and cartoons, but before I get started, I want to mention a couple things. First of all, this crutch, the, the first question. Um, I, tore, I partially tore my ACL skiing a week and a half ago. Then a week ago, I, was, I had planned a ski trip, but I couldn't ski, so I had to watch everyone else ski while I was on a crutch, which is annoying. Uh, the second thing is, um, I'm a grad student at UW Madison. I study optimization machine learning, which is why I'm giving this talk. Uh, I'm also ST Siebert on Twitter and GitHub, and that's important because the last thing I tweeted, oh shit, uh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> the last thing I was going to tweet, but I forgot to was a link to these slides, but that I know, I know that link is too long, uh, so I, there's a shorter version, and that shorter version will appear in the bottom right on every slide after this. I feel like I get too anxious about this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a piece, the piece of software we wrote, it's called Next. Uh, the reason it's interesting is because it's implemented in pure Python, and uh, it enables research by producing better results with, uh, with the same budget, time or money or whatever. Okay, so the problem next solves is one of data collection in machine learning. So machine learning as the current state of the, you know, the current state of machine learning is to assume that the data has already been collected, do a bunch of complex mathematics to produce some results. What we said is if the data collection process is expensive and costly, we may want to use some of that mathematics and machine learning to help us out and help reduce the cost of data collection. Okay, and so the the place where we oh, I was heading for the screen. The the place where we saw this was a problem was in crowdsourcing because you had to pay people for their time or money to answer a bunch of questions. And so so we had some applications where we wanted to ask humans a bunch of questions, but paying a bunch of questions, like, you know, millions. Uh, so it was expensive in terms of, you know, we had to pay them for their time, that was expensive. What I mean by this um, is, so here's an example of a crowdsourcing problem. So when you see Google's a model robot prompt, you don't, know, you don't know it, but secretly, you are a crowdsourcing participant. Because what happens is, um, so you see this prompt, they ask you to type some numerals that show in the image. You type 250, hit verify, and go on your way. But what's really happening is um, they're collecting all these responses and feeding, feeding them into some machine learning pipeline to train a machine learning model to predict exactly what you did. So given, given another image of you know, like maybe 759 instead of 250, they want that machine learning model to take the image and predict 759. Uh, so your response is being used in some crowdsourcing experiments to, 
generate some data set. Do you have a question? No, I just right. was interested. I, I, I saw, are, are there any questions? Yeah, I, I, you would think, yeah. What? You, you wouldn't put that much meaning to it. Right, right, right. I mean, yeah, so, so this is, um, they've made some wonderful data sets, mm -hmm. but I'm not Google, right? I, I don't have access to millions of users that visit my webpage every single day. I can't do that. I don't have those resources. Uh, so my goal is to achieve the same thing that Google does, but with minimal responses. You know, because I, I don't want to pay people. I don't have the time, or I can't pay people. I can't pay people for their responses, right? Okay. So how do we do this? So, so this so this system right here is something we call a passive system. It says I want to ask these questions. It asks those questions, and it gets some results. Right, so so in this case, it says, so I want to ask questions. You know, that look two five zero, it collects those questions, be humans, and produces some machine learning model. One way to <coughs> to require fewer responses is to adapt to the result that's produced. So so th this is putting the human in the loop in some sense, right? It's saying, you know, given given the result you've seen, which questions are most important? You know, you're asking the high-value questions. Okay, so, so the main benefit behind this is that we can require is that we can require fewer responses to achieve the same result. Um, so our, our goal, so our goal, the goal of our software, is to adapt to previous responses to achieve this goal. To uh, to uh, to adapt the previous responses to require fewer responses, All right? So the main benefit behind this is that the data collection cost with adaptive systems is far less than passive systems. So here, I'm plotting the data collection cost on the y-axis and the problem difficulty on the x-axis, and we see that for very easy problems, passive and adaptive algorithms are about the same. For very difficult problems, or very large problems, passive or adaptive algorithms are adaptive algorithms are much cheaper than passive algorithms. So a quick example of this, a quick example of this is with sorting. So let's say I'm using a passive sort, like a doubly nested for loop, uh, that requires order n squared responses. If I use an adaptive sort, like quick sort, it requires on average order n log n responses. Which is much less, and that and that that's a result that's characterized by this curve. So existing existing crowdsourcing systems are passive by definition because they don't have the the, the callback required to evaluate question importance based on previous responses. Our system does, which is why we're adapt, which, which is why we can be adaptive, and other systems are by definition definition passive. I mean, so Next can run a passive a passive algorithm really easily. It's just you know, it, it's a Next is a superset of the passive systems, I guess, in some sense. Um, and so this has very real benefits. Uh, it enables so the, the reason Next was created uh, was because a psychologist came to us came to us with some very difficult problem, and they couldn't do it with a passive algorithm. It would cost too much money, and they wouldn't ask high value questions. We built the system, and we enabled their research, and they published a paper off it. Okay, so I've said a lot of words, and I feel like I'm not making very much sense. Uh, but here's an example of what I mean, okay? So let's say we're collecting labels of fruits on two different axes, maybe, you know, height and weight or something. And we've collected, you know, labels of apples and oranges. And we can we can draw some classifier represented by this blue line that's that separates the two, right? Now the thing next does is it chooses where to sample next. So so you know, so we ask the question, what point would give us the most information? And that point is represented by this red dot. Because this because this is the point that we're most uncertain about, right? Uh, it's the closest to this the to the decision boundary. So you know this is the point that has the highest probability that like we're unsure, right? 
It's like halfway between the apples and oranges. We're, we're not sure about it. And this point is different. And after we learn that, after we learn that it's an orange, our classifier changes pretty dramatically. So that's what I mean by requiring fewer responses. If we had collected a, a point that was very far away from the, the, the decision boundary, our classifier may, may not change at all. So we want to adapt to previous responses, adapt to previous responses to find the truth quicker. Does that make sense? All right. Good, because that's what our software is based off of. That's what our software does. Uh, but it does this in the crowdsourcing context. So our software is called Next because we want to ask the next best question. Uh, or we, no, we want to ask the best question next. Um, but anyway, so it was created. <laughs> it was created by um, Kevin Jamison and Rob Nowak, Professor Rob Nowak, who's my PI, um, with the help of Lao Jane. Uh, but the work in this talk will be a work that Daniel Ross, Lao Jane, and I did. Um, we, made, we made it easy for our collaborators to use. Uh, I'd also like to thank our funding sponsors. Um, without these groups, our software would not be possible. Oh, and I should add, we, we all worked for Rob at some point. I'm the only one left. Everyone else moved on to bigger and better things. Although working for Rob is fun and all that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't diminish that. Um, so our software is pretty widely used. It's used all the way from machine learning theory all the way down to practitioners. An example of the machine learning research is with the Air Force Research Lab. They're using our software. I can't really discuss what. It's classified, I think. Uh, but I can discuss the practitioner case. Which, so the New Yorker is using our software for a very practical, a practical problem. So the problem they have is that each week, so is their cartoon caption contest. So each week, so I, so each week they receive a cartoon from their cartoonists, but this cartoon does not have a caption. So they ask their readers for funny captions. They receive something like 5,000 captions, of which they have to find the funniest one. This is a very difficult, a very difficult problem, right? It, there's a lot of captions, and humor is notoriously difficult. You have to ask humans. Um, so with like, so with, um, I was going to say something. Oh yeah, so th this is a problem meant for adaptive data sampling because it is a very difficult problem. And using a pa so we've done experiments on this. Using a passive algorithm, you can't find the funniest caption with any confidence. Using an adaptive algorithm, you can. We want to enable that. Uh, and it turns out we do. Our software now runs this caption each week, this contest each week. Um, it's available at these two URLs. Um, but here, the, the interface we present is shown here. Uh, so we say, here's the cartoon, and here's one caption. You can write that caption as unfunny, somewhat funny, or funny. And after you do, uh, the caption turns gray for a while, and a new caption shows up. Now, there's a lot of math behind that new caption and how, it, how it's chosen, but the intuition is pretty valuable. And it's, so, so our goal is to find the funniest caption, meaning it really only makes sense to ask about the funny captions. If something has been rated as unfunny, you know, nothing but unfunnies, it's probably not that funny, and we probably shouldn't ask about it, right? I mean, so something like two thirds of all captions are unfunny, why do we, we, we don't want to waste two thirds of our human response budget on clearly unfunny captions. We don't want to do that. Um, so this is the interface we present to you, so the crowdsourcing participant. This is the interface we present to Bob Mankoff. He cares about the, the funniest caption, so we show him a list of captions rated by funniness. We also show some other information, like, uh, like for this contest, we collected about half a million responses, and we see that Bob Mankoff sent an email to this interface right about here. <coughs> As you can imagine, this data is really valuable, especially for a machine learning research lab like I work in. Uh, so we've recorded. So we've we've been running this contest for about two years now. We've collected something like 33 million button clicks to over 440,000 unique captions over like 80 contests or something. This is super valuable. Um, that cannot be ignored. I'll mention more of this later.
But first, I want to show you the funniest caption, uh, because I couldn't cheat you otherwise. Yeah, so that's the funniest caption, but uh, and I'm going to mention the other points. So the first thing we notice is that our software works. Uh, our software requires fewer responses, as illustrated by this graph. So the green line there, you can't, it's, it's hard to see, but we require four times fewer responses. This is huge. Our software works. This is what Bob Mankoff cares about. Um, we've also collected some other valuable information. We, for one, we have some more insight on what, uh, on what the, on how funny the captions are, right? So most captions are very, very unfunny. The funniest captions lie around this one point. There's only, it's, it's, it's I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what that says. Uh, <laughs> and so, so the next point we see is a little, is a little more academic. We see that some of our, some, some of the violations we make are not satisfied. Some of the assumptions we make are violated. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> So we assume that every response is IID, or it's independent and identically distributed, meaning that we assume that the probability of rating something as unfunny is the same no matter who you are, how many captions you've seen, whatever. It's all the same. However, we see that as you see more and more captions, you get tired, and you're more likely to rate things as unfunny. That violates our assumptions. Our algorithm should not work in this case, or it has no guarantees of finding the funniest one. So this is a problem. <laughs> the next thing we see, um, so we've generated some, you know, two papers from this that mention specifically this data set. And the last point is the most important one. Our software now works at scale. Uh, so for the first year and a half, we were running this as an experiment. Um, something, you know, that, you know, it'd be nice if it works, you know, for large scale, but now it does. Uh, so now the New Yorker can publish, can, can put this on their front page, hopefully, don't quote me, put, put, put this on their front page, and users can go to it, you know, five billion users can go to it, and our software won't fail. Uh, it uses some AWS lambdas. Um, yeah, this is nice. And, and this entire slide speaks to our larger goal. Our larger goal is to connect the adaptive sampling algorithms with crowdsourcing. So... I mean, both have other uses. Like, crowdsourcing is used all over in psychology, and adaptive data sampling is used in, like, radar and medical imaging and all this, but there is some intersection. And we want to enable adaptive data algorithms in this, in this intersection. So we want to tell the crowdsourcing, the people, the people who use crowdsourcing, hey, you need fewer responses, and we want them to give us, our to give us their data and the problems they see with it. We want to enable this. Why? Because arguably, some of the deepest insights and greatest innovations come through experimentation. We want to enable this. Uh, this, is, this is incredibly valuable, both to us and to them. This is, this is huge, this is feedback. The only way to do that, that we found in practice, is to build a piece of software, and that's what we did. Now, in order for this feedback loop to exist, two things have to happen. The software has to be useful, and has to be easy to use, because otherwise people won't use it. Right? And if people don't use it, they won't talk about it, and they won't use it for their experiments, which is what we want. Um, and it has to be easy to use by both the crowdsourcing community and the people who write algorithms. I'm going to mention both of those later. But first, I want to mention why, how it's useful. So the first use case is with the New Yorker Cartoon Caption Contest. And in this, we say, you can rate one item as uh, three buttons, or it can be n buttons in general. You could have 15 buttons instead. I don't see why you would, but you could. Uh, and the one item I mentioned, so right now we're rating a piece of text, the caption. You could, you could rate you know, a video, an image, a uh, piece of text, a GIF, whatever, anything HTML can display. Anything that pops up in your, pops up in your web browser. Uh, we call this interface Cardinal Bandits. Uh, that's what it's referred to in the literature. Our next use case, and we have adaptive algorithms for this by default. Our next use case is with dueling bandits, uh, and it asks about two items instead of one item. We have adaptive algorithms by default that choose, they can find the best, class, the best item in some set. 
So, for example, this is asking you to select by compare. So, right, by comparing two items. So, in this use case, we're trying to find the safest street by asking which street looks safer. This is very similar to sorting, but it's a little. But crowdsourcing makes it a little tricky. Um, I'll mention more of this later. So, the third use case we have is useful in generating some similarity metric. So. Um, so let's say you want some similarity map of faces. You know, you want all the happy faces in one place, all the unhappy faces in another. This is useful for that because we say which of the bottom two items is most similar to the top item. Uh, we have adaptive algorithms for this by default, and I'll mention more of this later. I'll point out this use case specifically, um, and then. Uh, so I should also mention that we have a we have a REST API. So. Um, you don't have to go through our web interface. You can just use it. Uh, you can send JSON back and forth. This is how the New Yorker interacts with, interacts with our system. And so we have, so this has seen use in practice. So we have seen use by, uh, by psychology labs, computer science labs, our lab in, at UW-Madison. And we've also seen use from uh, other companies. I don't know if I can mention their names, but I can mention what fields they work in. So one is with social media, and one is with insurance, um, and one is with military. Uh, we, have, we have seen a lot of use. This has seen traction. It is easy to use. That's the main reason. So now I want to mention ease of use for the crowdsourcing experimentalists. This is you. If, you're, if you want to use Next, this is you. So. The interface we present for the crowdsourcing experimentalists is we all we require is a web browser and an Amazon account or an Amazon AWS account. That's all we require. Um, so after you make an account, you go to their Elastic Cloud Compute Service or EC2. Then you click on a nice big blue button that says launch an instance. Because that's what you want to do. You want to launch an instance with our software. And then you find our software and our, our, our Amazon machine image or something, our operating system. Uh, you select our AMI, and then you configure a couple other small details, like you have to add some memory, you have to choose the right instance, you have to open a couple ports. It's not huge. It's just, and there's more detail in the documentation, but, uh, but this is all we require. Now, you might ask, well, shouldn't, to run your software, shouldn't I have to download some code or something? And yes, you can. You absolutely can. Um, and it runs via Docker. It runs with, I think, three commands. Uh, it's pretty simple. So after you after you launch Next, um, you see you see an HTML page that just, that says you know here's the state of Next. It says here's the list of all your running experiments, but you haven't launched anything yet. So below that is an experiment launch, and when you click on that link, you see this page. This page requires the upload of two files. One is a zip file of your targets or your uh, your objects, and it's described more in the text there. But the other file is more, more important, and it's perhaps harder to. It, it, it describes the other file describes the state of the experiment you want, you want to run. So it describes you know cardinal bandits, dueling bandits, school based triplets, um, and it's it's really not clear what should go in this file. I mean, like what format is this file in? So if you go back to the previous page. You click on documentation uh, or examples. It shows you uh, what exactly should go in that file. This, docu this, is, this is documented and type checked. So this, is, this has to work. If it's said here, it has to work. Um, and so you see that you have to have some key you know, called participant to algorithm management. And then if you, if you wonder, like, oh, hey, what should these values be by default, I guess? Uh, you can go back and click on the examples on GitHub and see an example of that file. This is all that's required, and we've seen use of this in practice. So it is pretty easy to use for the crowdsourcing experiments list. I would, I mean, so I, I gave a talk at SciPy this last summer, and someone in the crowd, someone from a social media company in the crowd, saw my talk, was like, oh, hey, that, that might be useful. So they took it back to their company. On one of their hack days, they launched our software and started using it, and now it's being used in practice. So it's, Super cool. So now I want to mention, so that's all I'm going to mention for ease of use for the experimentalists. 
Now I'm going to mention ease of use for the algorithm developer. This is me in my day job, right? I, I'm like, oh, hey, I have a new, a new adaptive algorithm. Let's try it out and see how it works. Before I go any further, are there any questions on all anything I showed earlier? <laughs> okay, I, yeah? Quick question, is it free? Is there a licensing fee? Or? It's open source and free. Um, uh, I don't know if that's a mistake, it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, even worse, we went to the New Yorker and they asked us, oh, hey, you know, how much, how much do you want us to pay for this software? And we said, oh, it's open source. <laughs> yeah, I know, missed opportunity. Um, but, I mean, with money comes responsibility, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now ease of use for the algorithm developer. This is me, my day job. So any adaptive algorithm requires four functions. Uh, I mean, one function is for initial, initialization, and one function is for getting results. It's not that important. Um, most of the time in an adaptive algorithm is spent here. So here, so we, so we call a gateway every time we want to see a new caption, and we call a process answer every time we click on the caption. Um, so the question is, so that's all an adaptive algorithm is, it's just these four functions. And the question is, how do we design these functions? What choices do we make? So that's the next slide. It's uh, what choices do we make, and then what do the what have these choices enabled? Um, and to show this, I'll show three specific use cases of you know of people in our lab that have done something novel and interesting because our system was easy to use. So the choices we make, the first choice we make, or the yeah, the first choice we make is using a high-level language like Python uh, because it allows um, developers like me who only care about math, although I care about more, who only care about math, to write down what they want in code pretty easily using NumPy or any of this. Not anything like C, which would be hard. Um, the next point, the next point, the next thing we do is we treat algorithms as black boxes. So... This allows some for some some mathematician that has an adaptive algorithm, has two adaptive algorithms, to say, oh, I want to unplug one and put another one in, or compare them side by side, or something like that. This is really easy to do. Why? Uh, because in practice, all this means is that the inputs and outputs are documented and type checked. So, for example, some function called getQuery might expect some string called participant ID. And might return some the index of some caption to ask about. That's um, that's all we require. Just inputs and outputs, nothing more. And so another thing that's enables is it allows you to do whatever you want and whatever tools you want to. So you can call you know TensorFlow, PyTorch, NumPy, whatever. We don't care. All we care is the inputs and outputs. You can do whatever else you want. Uh, so. The second choice you make is we notice that most adaptive algorithms, almost all adaptive algorithms, have to store states and they have to run background jobs. Uh, or so they have to store state and they have to update some internal model. Uh, so we give some nice wrapper for this to allow this to happen. We call it the butler because it helps us. Um, it's pretty nice. The third choice you make may seem trivial, but we abstract objects to integers. So we, so if you're asking about ARM42, we don't, you only know that you're asking about ARM42, you don't know that you're asking about the, the text, you know, the answer to life, life, the universe, and everything. Um, and I mean, this is important, and this is like how I think about it, this is how we test. Uh, and plus, there's a mapping from integers to object details, so I don't know why you'd change it, uh, although you can if you want, but so, um, so the next thing that's valuable for the algorithm developer is the dashboard. The dashboard is incredibly valuable because it describes how well your algorithm is doing. And if we had more than one algorithm in this, in this use case, like right now we only have, uh, uh, doesn't work, um, KLUCB. Uh, it's shown in the below rankings right there. If we had more algorithms, those would just be more tabs so we can compare them very easily. Uh, so, and these are these are the results, and we can see the results easily. 
However, we can see more information. For example, we can compare the timing of all the, of all the algorithms. You know, so this, you know, for each of the four functions, you know, this is how long each of those took. We can also see more information. We also have some client-side timings. So we can see how long the, the crowd-testing participant was waiting for a caption, or how long, they, how, how long they were waiting for a caption, or how long they took to respond to, a, to rate a certain caption. And then you can even do some more advanced stuff like testing on a holdout sets. We also support that, uh, which is incredibly valuable for an algorithm developer like me. OK, so that's how easy it is to use for the algorithm developer. Now I'm going to mention three use cases that illustrate how um, that because of the ease of use for the algorithm developer, these choices have been enabled. So I'm going to mention these three choices, these three experiments. So, so these three experiments, one has to do with shoes and finding the right shoe for Q, um, which is a critical task. Uh, the next one is uh, finding the safety of, city streets, safety of city streets in Chicago. And the third task has to do with something with faces and some psychology experiments. Um, I mean, I'm no, I mean, so the psychologist, so I mentioned that Next was created because of this. So the reason they were, it was created was because the psychologist wanted some, yeah, they, they, they wanted some low dimensional similarity map of facial emotions. So they wanted, so, so we can see that all the really joyful faces are up at the top. All the really happy faces are right here. And I don't really know why they wanted this, but they wanted it. Uh, um, Specifically, uh, two psychologists, Tim, Tim Rogers and April Murphy, they came to Rob Nowak and Kevin Jamison, and they said, oh, hey, we want to do this. Can you help? And they enlisted the help of Law, and they built a system. And they decided on the question to be the simplest in terms of working memory to, to be a comparison. You know, so, you know, which of the bottom two faces, facial emotions, is most similar to the top face, facial emotion. So if you thought, if you thought uh, these two face, facial emotions were more similar, you would select this face either with clicking on it or with the right arrow. This is the problem that works best with working memory. Like I could ask, you know, given you know, which of the 15 bottom faces are most similar to the top face, but my working memory is not that good. Uh, maybe yours is. <laughs> We, I mean, we, we, could, we could also ask people to, like, you know, drag around faces on some similarity map, but, like, what does that even mean? So this is the simplest example. The main problem with this is that the number of questions, so given a number of faces, the, no, the number of questions scales poorly. So if you, if you have n faces, you have about n cubed questions to ask, possible questions to ask. This is difficult because finding the best questions becomes challenging. Like... You may be asking like something that doesn't even make sense, like what's more similar to hope, a giraffe or a space shuttle? That doesn't make any sense, right? Like, fi so finding the best questions becomes really challenging, especially when there are many faces. So this problem is actually really interesting mathematically, and we've generated a couple papers out of it. These are only the algorithm developer papers. None of these, except for the last one, are really um, application papers. But most importantly, we have solved the, the psychologist problem. They asked for some map of facial emotions, and we made that. So we see that all the, all the angry faces are in the bottom left, and all the really happy faces are in the upper right. Um, now, if you look at this, uh, I mean, I'm no, I'm no psychologist, so don't quote me. Um, so I looked at this and I was like, oh, I see two dimensions. I see an intensity dimension and a positivity dimension. <laughs> so like boredom is over here. Uh, fury and surprise are up there. Um, happy and joy are on the top of the positiv positivity axis. And unhappiness is on the, on the other end. So that's the motivating use case for next. Uh, we solved this problem. Another example of something we solved was one of, is we, we call this street score. And it was rating the safety of city streets in Chicago. 
And we wanted to see how humans perceive that and how they actually match the, you know, the crime rate in that, in that, in their area where that street was. And so we were interested in, um, so some collaborators at UChicago were interested in showing pictures of streets, uh, pictures of streets in Chicago and seeing which one was safer. Now, the best way to do this, again, working memory, is by asking which of the two streets looks safer. Because I have a hard time rating the safety of city streets just with one image. Um, and plus, this is more interesting mathematically. Uh, so they, they use Google Street View images so they can map the, the perceived safety of city streets onto the actual safety of city streets based on the crime rate or homicide rate or whatever. Now, the problem with this is that um, there is a clustered ranking. I, I don't think of, you know, oh, this street has a, you know, a 39.1 risk of some crime happening. I think, oh, no, this is a safe street, this is a somewhat safe street, or this is an unsafe street. That's really about it. Uh, there are some advantages to this, such as uh, it's very similar to sorting, which is a well-studied problem. And so maybe this will help. And so, so then the question is, how do we overcome this issue of clustered ranking in the presence of crowdsourcing? And so we've generated a paper off that. Uh, and so they, 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 they give some algorithm for clustered ranking in crowdsourcing. Uh, Samit is the main, Samit Kataria is the main person on this. He's one of my uh, lab mates. Uh, he had the help of Law Jane in creating this algorithm. Um, and the collaborators, collaborators at UChicago were Nandana and James Evans. And of course, we had the help of Rob, our PI, Rob Nowak. Um, but so, again, I'm not going to get into the math of the algorithm, but what they do is pretty interesting. So they say, so let's say we have two groups, a safe, a safe group and an unsafe group represented by that dotted line there. Now, we want to ask about points because we have a clustered ranking. We want to ask about points that we're most uncertain about that could possibly lie in the other boundary, in the other bucket. So, uh, so the, point, the, the points with the red arrows are the points that we're most uncertain about and could possibly lie in, in, in the other group. Uh, the, the, right. So I'm plotting uh, street safety by um, street index, and they're sorted by default. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter in practice um, or functionally. But uh, and then the, the bars are confidence intervals. So, so we see that for, for the point on the very far left with red, it's, it's mean it's mean is the lowest in the other group, and it could it's most possible to lie in the in the unsafe group. Okay. So notably, uh, at first glance, we don't see any gains from adaptive algorithms. Uh, so here I'm plotting uh, the fraction of um, of pairs that got wrong versus the number of responses, and we see that uh, that the error rates or the fraction of this is, is the same for an adaptive algorithm and a passive algorithm. This is really concerning. It means that this is a really easy problem or something. We don't see any gains from active learning. So when, so Samit gave his prelim in this November, I think. And when Rob asked the question, who studies, you know, Rob Nowak, who studies active learning, he spent his whole life doing this. He asked, you know, oh, hey, why don't we see any gains? You know, should the study a thing? You know, I study this. This should help, right? And Smith's answer made a lot of sense. It's, you know, the answers are pretty noisy. There's not much active learning can do. It's just, it's an easy problem because it, they're so noisy. So, but, it, but if you look a little closer, our, our algorithm wasn't trying to get complete sorting and look at the, look at the safe as of any street. It was saying which, um, it had some groups, right? So within each group, they were completely, completely the same. So if we look in this case, uh, if we run some simulations where we actually have well-defined groups, uh, we see that an adaptive algorithm outperforms a passive algorithm, which suggests that in this street case, that our adaptive algorithm actually had benefits. So we couldn't see that from the actual error rate. Uh, this game is kind of subtle. Okay. Um, So the third example is with image search. I'm going to 
Um, so let's say we're thinking of some shoe, or let's say we're trying to find the right shoe, some shoe that looks like that, but we have to go to the Zappos database, which is many, many shoes, and we can't really do it. Um, so we're going to ask yes-no questions of do you like this shoe or do you not? Uh, this is very similar to the cartoon ca the captions. Um, but the, the main thing behind this is that we had a large database of the entire Zappos shoes, 50,000 of them. And so every time a user clicked a button, we had to go search over the entire data set, and it took 1.2 seconds. I was on this, it took, and I optimized it as far as I could systems. It took 1.2 seconds, so I got it down to that, for the next question to appear, which is too far in the web, which is too long in the web context. And so, I mean, so I optimized this as far as I could systems, but uh, Kwong here, uh, he optimized this from the math perspective, which is he changed the problem we're, try he changed the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, he did this along with Rudy, uh, who, this is his problem, uh, and Rob Novak and Becca Willett both helped out with this. Uh, but the main thing they did is they said instead of exhaustively evaluating all shoes in the data set, you know, women's shoes, men's shoes, kids' shoes, they said let's just selectively evaluate some shoes. So if you, cho if you chose red boots, Maybe they would example if they would evaluate this function at the union of red and boots, or maybe the intersection. Whatever they they have some mathematical mathematical technique for this to prove gains. Now they've generated some real world results with this with real human data, and they see that their method, which is shown in purple there, um, has similar reward to to other adaptive algorithms. Uh, so here I'm plotting reward versus number of human responses. And we see that their purple thing doesn't perform super well, but doesn't perform super bad. However, this plot is hiding a dimension. It's, it's hiding a dimension of, you know, how fast did you get a response, right? Um, so, I mean, so it may be that the purple or the blue and red lines may take, a, you know, may take 10 seconds for the algorithm to respond, which is not really suitable in practice. So from all, from all these use cases, we have seen some software enhancements. We've spent, you know, this has been my job to improve the software. Um, however, before I leave, I, I mean, so these are enhancements, but before I leave, I'm going to leave with a couple key messages. So the first one is that adaptive data collection can reduce the cost of data collection. The second message is that Next is a crowdsourcing tool that enables adaptive data collection. Notice I did not say that Next will reduce your data collection costs. Uh, I mean, it in in general in with high probability, it can do no worse than than before than the passive case, and you may see benefits, but you may see benefits. I did not say you will see benefits. That's a very important distinction. Our, our system is not magic. It can't do what, no, what nothing can do. Uh, the third message is that Next is easy to use by everyone involved. Uh, notice I said easy to use with a star. Next is a piece of academic software that was created out of collaboration. By easy to use, I mean that our collaborators are not in our face every week asking questions. Um, I mean, and I, I should stress that Next is pretty easy to use. It, I mean, it has been used by other companies. Um, I mean, I gave a talk at SciPy, and someone in the audience was like, oh, hey, this might be useful with our problem at our company. Let's use it. And they did it in less than a day. This is good. Um, all of you could probably use it, too. And the fourth message is that um, we built Next to enable this feedback loop to get feedback both through ADAR research and to um, improve our software. So, uh, so this person that I gave this, uh, the person that started using, using our software after SciPy, she talked to me, she said, hey, we're using, we're using your software. Uh, I said, great, um, here's our PI and here's a couple other mathematicians that helped create Next. And now one of them is helping them with their problem. Uh, this is perfect. He'll get a paper and she'll solve her problem. Optimally, this is perfect. Um, and so please tell us if you're using your system. Like, we have a whole Gitter channel on our README. Uh, we want to hear about your problems. Uh, this will help everyone involved. Uh, so with that, thank you. And I guess I'm asking for questions.
really nice talk, and yeah, thanks also yeah. for making this open source and sharing mm -hmm. that with us. But one question, let's say, if I'm interested in using that tool in context of labeling a data set for classification machine learning. Mm -hmm. So how do you, um, so your um, metric to say that this is better than the passive model, how would that be implemented? I mean, I think it's very domain specific, but is it something like, um, I think I didn't really get that part, would it be like, I run a passive algorithm, then your system, and then let's say I train on the generated data set or classifier and see which classifier is better, or basically seeing if I could, with fewer responses, get a better, better classifier out of it? Yeah, that, that's exactly the benefit, and we, and we test for that, so. Can you repeat the question? Yes, so the question, <laughs> let me rephrase it. The question was, how do I tell, um, how do I tell if adaptive algorithm is better? Yeah, in, in a machine learning. Yeah, in a machine learning context. So the way you can tell is by training on a holdout set, and you would see that as the number of responses increase, our our system will have lower holdout test or lower test error. So yeah. in the same context, then you would require some labeled data as a hold set, holdout set up front, then. Or? No, no. So so we don't. So uh, so we do support um, having like three algorithms by default. So. So you would you would collect one data set uh, randomly as, a, as your test data set. You would collect one data set just as a passive algorithm and one data set as an adaptive algorithm. And then you would test on the holdout set Af after after you run your experiment to completion. And uh, last thing, uh, yeah. so can I use any uh, classifier I like, or do you provide classifiers that has to be uh, classifier that has to be used for that purpose? So the question was. Uh, what classifiers um, do you provide by default? Uh, so right. Yeah. So, um, so perhaps I, I I should have made this more clear. So we support using anything you like to make your adaptive algorithm. So you can use all of SKLearn. You can use all of PyTorch. You can use whatever you want. All we care about are the inputs and outputs of anything. Okay. And so there is a function called get results, in which you would, um, you know, produce the results. Say, you know, my classifier produced this error. Yeah, you just slide that, I think, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, early in your presentation, you uh, used a highly technical term, bandit. Oh, bandit, Can yeah. You explain what that means and how it got its name. So, uh, so we, um, so it came from bandit. So, uh, so this is the case of the, all right, so we think of a multi arm bandit where some bandit walks into a casino. And he has multiple arms to pull on multiple slot machines. He wants to pull the slot machine that gives him the most reward or the most money. Okay. And so that's where it comes from. So technical, I got confused. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so in, in the real world, like yeah. the New Yorker, do they choose what and present the funniest? Do they choose and present to the public the funniest algorithm, you know, the funniest Caption. Uh, so you're asking. So after after after, the, after it's all done, and basically, right. do they actually always? If they do that, do they always choose the top one, or do they sort of like, you mm. know, because humor is a very right. subjective yeah, thing. Right, so right. right. So so the question was, how does the New Yorker choose the funniest caption? Do they always choose the funniest one as rated by our, our system, or do they choose the fifth one as rated by our system? And the answer is, I'm not sure. Um, that's a New Yorker, not me. That's internal to them. I do know that before our system was, you know, before two years ago, they had some intern rating the funniness, like grouping the captions together <laughs> and rating the funniness, and then they had some whole rule-based system. Uh, so we are improving. So, so past our system, I'm not sure. I believe they choose, they look at like the top ten or something, and you know, it it narrows down the list easier for them. We are improving their humor because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because because we're we're saying you know it's it's easier for them it's better for them it's you know it's easier for them they find the right answer quicker they you know it's not some intern anymore, and it produces the right result and so we do have theoretical guarantees that uh, the, the the funniest caption should always rise to the top and we have we do include um, for any repeats we include uh, that, that caption twice and we have seen we have seen both captions float to the very top one in spots one and two. So our our theory has been shown to work in practice, which is kind of cool. Uh, on the left there. Yeah. <clears throat> so in the case of the uh, example we we're just talking about. Yeah. Um, if, would you anticipate that any type of like error is introduced if 
there was a scenario where someone was rating a comic and they either didn't get the joke or they were just an outlier. And then I think what you said was that the next time around that would not be surfaced to someone to review because it's been marked as not funny. Right, right. But if the case was just that the distribution of funniness, that person was on some far extreme and most of the people actually thought it was funny, does right. that affect the outcome? Yeah, so the question was, what if, what if some strange person doesn't think a caption is funny and rates it as unfunny even though everyone else thinks it's funny, right? Yeah. All right. So every caption, so all the bounds hold with very high probability. Uh, so all the theoretical bounds hold with high probability, meaning that there's very low probability of someone coming in and answering that, or that's what we assume. Now, uh, in practice, every caption is rated at least 16 times. Uh, yeah, so there's... 16 people would have to at least screw this up. Okay, that, that answers my question. All right. You mentioned no. that um, with you're using AWS Lambda right. or some or perhaps all of these things. Uh, could you go into a little bit of depth about what your experiences were doing that with uh, machine learning? And yeah, so I, well, I can't answer that directly. It wasn't me that was using AWS Lambda. It was um, Liam Marshall and Law Jane that did this. Um, so I can't, I can't say anything about my experience. Uh, I can say that not, uh, so Next is not implemented as AWS Lambdas. We said this caption contest is specific to, it needs to work at scale. How can we enable that? And that was with, so only the caption contest runs in an AWS, AWS Lambdas. In the back then? Uh, are there any ethical concerns that the lab has about using this for, like the uh, Uh, so the question is, do you see this as doing better than humans do? Are there any ethical applications of doing this? Um, I, I think this is, this is, so I'll, I'll give you the developer's answer. So this is a tool. Uh, you can use it forever, whatever you want to. <laughs> Uh, if that's ethical, I, I, I don't think rating graduate students would be ethical. That, uh, that <laughs> as a graduate student, I have problems with that. <laughs> I guess that's not far off from the, uh, even rating streets as safe or unsafe. Right, right. right. Uh, there could be tons of biases there. And, yeah. and even I was questioning, um, the question asked about whether or not the street is safe, if you're being very literal about it, right. versus seeing cars and inferring that a rusty car is that safe or unsafe, yeah. right? Or low income? Or, or, or another, another thing I've noticed is that if the picture is cloudy, you're more, you're more likely to rate it as unsafe. Just, yeah. Uh, Brian? Uh, there's a decent amount of work on like rate, um, modeling the people who respond to crowdsource teams, like modeling which of your trip workers are good or not. Oh, how yeah. How well to, how, how much to take, is there any, uh, is that built in at all? Or is there so the question is, there, the, the, there's a lot of work out there that's saying, you know, my Turkers are only, you know, only this good. You know, they may answer the question too quickly or something. Maybe you want to prune those responses out or weight them less importantly. Um, and, you know, is there anything built in for this? And uh, no, there's not. Not right now. Um, we can enable it pretty easily because uh, every, so there is a participant ID for every question that's asked. So every time you press a button, some, participant, some random participant ID gets sent back to next. Um, so we can see if the same person has answered the same question more than once. And you brought up another point I forgot to mention. Um, so the psychology users of Next, the main users of Next perhaps, uh, they, the way they use it is they collect some demographic information via Mechanical Turk, and then they send them, they send them a link to Next. They answer, a bunch of, they answer a bunch of questions on Next, and then it, uh, it displays their, partici their partici the participant ID, which the psychologists can see in the responses. And they paste that back into paste that back into Mechanical Turk. So it, it can be used with, with, with passive crowdsourcing systems. 
So I think we'll we'll leave it at that. Uh, let's all give uh, Scott another round of applause and thank you. <laughs>